Hello, everybody, and welcome to Community Conversations here at Atlantic Health System. My name is Luke Margolis. I'm the Corporate Communications Director for Atlantic Health. And today, I'm excited to be joined by two guests who will talk about a new program which we have touched on here at Atlantic Health, but I think is going to be really exciting for everybody to learn a little bit more about. So let me introduce my guests. We'll start with my far stage left, <laughs> screen right, if you will. <laughs> Dr. Sharon Engel is the Chair of Medicine at Overlook Medical Center. And to her right, seated in our middle, is Dr. Linda Gillum. She is is the Dorothy and Lloyd Huck Chair of Cardiovascular Medicine here at Atlantic Health System. And they are both primarily involved in, in something that I think you're going to really find fascinating today, and that is the new transplant program, organ transplant program, specifically liver and heart, respectively, in relation to where I'm seated, here at Atlantic Health. Um, and uh, so, doctors, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Pleasure to be here and pleasure to have everybody uh, uh, watching us uh, virtually. Uh, yeah, it, virtually, and I wish we could fit everybody in here physically. <laughs> Luckily, that, that reminds me, it's, it, uh, you may notice that the three of us are, um, are not wearing masks. Uh, we, uh, on Community Conversations, uh, have trans transitioned uh, into that uh, setup. This is not a clinical area for some folks wondering. Uh, we are not taping this at one of our medical centers where masks are still required. So if folks are wondering that, uh, that is the reason we're not wearing them. We were also all vaccinated as well and encourage everybody out there to get their COVID-19 vaccine if they have not yet done so. Um, so doctors, if you'll indulge me one more minute, for those who have not seen Community Conversations before, we're gonna chat for a little while, but this is not just between the three of us, although we do like to talk to each other. Uh, we wanna hear from you too. So if you have a question or a comment, uh, feel free to add that there in the text field on your screen. We will get to as many questions, on topic questions please, uh, as we can in the time allotted. Uh, and if we can't get to you, we will certainly do our best to get you an answer in the text chat as well. So with all of that having been said, let's tuck into our topic because I think everybody's gonna find it fascinating. Dr. Gillum, if we could, I'd love to start with you um, and, and, and your role in the heart transplant part of this relationship. Let's talk a little bit about how exciting this is for, for us here at Atlantic and, and for our patients, um, how important it is that we can now provide this type of service to our patients. How exciting is this? It's very exciting. I'd like to start by putting really the concept of heart transplant in, in context. Heart transplant is the definitive treatment for people with advanced heart failure. And with more than 6.2 million people in the United States suffering from heart failure, you can tell that this is a large program, a problem rather. Not all of those people need transplant, okay. but a goodly number will at some point be candidates for transplant, and the number continues to go up. Luckily, uh, after decades really, where the number of hearts available to be transplanted was steady at 2,000, didn't change. There have been a number of important new changes in terms of what determines a heart to be eligible to be transplanted that have significantly increased the number of donor hearts that are available to be uh, transplanted. We have a large cardiology program at Gagnon. Mm -hmm. the, we provide quaternity uh, care for virtually every form of heart disease, including heart failure. But we have not, until this point, ventured into the heart transplant space other than to screen and prepare patients for transplant. So this partnership with NYU uh, allows us to really expand what we're able to do for patients who need to be transplanted, providing not only pre-transplant evaluation, but post-transplant care in partnership with NYU, one of the largest transplant programs in the tri-state area and one of the programs with the best quality outcomes. So to me, it seemed a no-brainer. And, and, and a game changer, really, for, yeah. for folks who are in need of these services. Dr. Engel, on the liver side, is the arrangement similar or, or different? Let's talk a little bit about how that works. So this is actually a new venture, I would say, for Atlantic to go into um, liver transplantation and advanced liver care. Although we were set up in many ways to take care of patients with advanced liver disease, uh, the one piece we were missing, which our affiliation with NYU Langone gives us, is uh, transplant hepatology, which is a, live, a, pay, a physician that expertise in liver disease and really advanced liver disease. Uh, that piece of the puzzle was the missing piece. This relationship gives us that um, by having one of their transplant hepatologists, again a liver doc, be on site at Overlook to be able to care for those patients in their home, right, environment, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so patients no longer have to travel. 
that physician is going to be supported by already an excellent team that we already have on site. You know, specialists in uh, liver surgery, specialists in what we call interventional radiology, who do procedures for patients with liver disease. Um, so we're really set up in a very similar way to help support the program, but this just takes us to the next level. And I echo um, Linda's comments that this is really, as liver disease advances, the real treatment, um, once okay. you get to a point, uh, is liver transplantation. So it is, it's a life-saving therapy. I wanted to talk about that. We're, we're talking, for, for those of our uh, members of our audience who um, maybe perhaps have a sort of a esoteric or broader sense of, of transplant, one, I, I presume most would assume that it is a complicated thing, but then also, too, that it is, this is a matter of life and death for a lot of these patients. Is that, that's not overstating it, is it? Not at all. It's, it's definitely not overstating it. The, uh, and, and the piece that's really important for people to understand is the quality of life that one can experience with heart transplant. We do have uh, uh, permanently implantable support devices, LVADs we call them, the, uh, but there's still, uh, despite all the advances, there still is not a device of that type that's fully implantable. So people who have these devices, they have to be mindful of making sure that the batteries are charged. There's a pack that people have to car carry. And there are limitations as to what people can do. When people have had a successful heart transplant, they can really get their lives back. They can get back to life the way they, uh, they had it when they were when they were well. Um, wow, that's transformative. What, it, it is absolutely transformative. And I think one of the things on the liver side which is extremely important is we don't have those devices, right? Yeah. We don't have um, something like dialysis per se when you end up on a kidney transplant list, right? Something to bridge you. So really this is yeah. critical for us to have a strong alliance, to be able to take care of our patients and their needs, um, you know, and to identify patients early, right, so that we're able to prep them, pick the appropriate candidates, do all those things that really take time to do, uh, and hopefully slow down the disease so that some patients may not require this, as Dr. Gillum said. So not every patient is qualifies for an organ transplant then. There is some screening and, and, and such that would need to be involved here. Absolutely. Um, let's do something, Dr. Engel, that you touched on that I want to touch on a little bit more it ties into how this will work, right? You mentioned about the care, receiving care close to home. And I want to talk about how important that must be to, to, to be close to your family support structure and others. But how will this work? If, a, let's say, a, either a, a liver patient or a heart patient um, is determined to be eligible for, for something like this and that there is an organ available, how will it work? When they come to us and they walk through our doors, what happens? What's our role in this process? For either, I'm sure they're both similar processes. So I can jump in for the hearts. The, uh, so um, patients are extensively screened, as you alluded to, to identify whether or not they're, they're candidate for transplant. There are things like blood typing, tissue typing, all these things sort of go, go into the mix. Uh, whether people have social support system, uh, have the psychological profile that they can that they can handle handle this. So there's really an extensive uh, uh, selection process for people who might be eligible, and then people get listed. The, and there's a priority score that's assigned based on a whole bunch of things we don't need to go into. Because there's not an infinite we, we, number of organs. Right? There, I mean, there are still, there's more, but there's no, there's not an, right. an infinite number. Good plug uh, for There's not an infinite number. There's not an infinite number. There you go. The, uh, so um, people would get uh, evaluated in, uh, with a conversation with our colleagues at, at NYU. And let's say when uh, a donor heart becomes available, they would go to NYU to have the heart transplant operation, which actually is not that complicated an operation. Uh, really? Yes, people sort of have the idea that it's got to be the most complicated of all the heart surgery that we do. In fact, it's one of the most straightforward <laughs> operations that, 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 we, uh, that we do. And then there's a recovery period. We have to deal with things like the possibility that the heart could be rejected. We have treatments for that. Uh, and then uh, there's uh, a more extended convalescence. We, we're taking people who are really, really sick. 
uh, and they giving them the ability to exercise again. People have to build back muscle strength. There's, uh, there's, a, there's a significant uh, uh, recovery period. After that, if all goes well, people are followed regularly. There's ways to look for uh, evidence of rejection, and if there is rejection, to jump in and, and to treat that aggressively and to treat that early. So I think one of the things that's really important, both of you have already talked about this, is being able to let our patients who live in New Jersey get all but the actual transplant surgery done close to home here in, here in New Jersey. In our case, it's going to be at Morristown Medical Center uh, in Morristown. So uh, an insurance case is going to be at, at, uh, at, at Overlook. But uh, uh, it's not a hard sell, I don't think, to anybody who's dealt with getting uh, into New York City from New Jersey to say that wouldn't you rather all of the things being equal, be able to stay closer closer to home. Sure, yeah. absolutely. Well, and I do, I do think that you have all the expertise here, right, between our colleagues at NYU, um, especially in the liver program, where they'll be here um, yeah. helping provide that advanced liver care um, and taking care of you before and after your transplantation. And I, I think your point exactly and what we've kept saying it can't be underestimated. Uh, I think both on the liver side as well as on the heart side, these patients are very sick, right? And, it, and they're tired, right? And they have a lot um, going on uh, medically. So anything we can do to ease that burden is completely what we should be doing, right? We need to be meeting our patients where they need to be met. Who, who are the liver patients who would be in need of, of a transplant? Yeah, so I think when people think of liver transplant, they think of diseases like uh, hepatitis B and hepatitis C because those have been our classic patients that, at least the largest patient population that has had liver disease that may advance. Um, interestingly, with a lot of the treatment we have for those two viruses, uh, that's a decreasing proportion, okay. thankfully, right? So sure. that's all good news. Um, but one of the largest increasing proportion uh, populations, I'm sorry, is what we call fatty liver. So that's kind of the, the colloquial term. Yeah, colloquial term yeah. Yes. Um, so that is probably the fastest rising cause of liver disease at this point. Um, and that really has to do with much of our other medical problems, right? Uh, our diabetes and our high blood pressure and our other types of what we call metabolic problems, right? Um, as well as our weight, right? So that also impacts it. Um, and we're seeing more and more patients being diagnosed by this almost incidentally, like hmm. there's no symptoms, yeah. right? So all of That's a sudden true. you get an ultrasound for some of your belly for some, some reason and they see this, or your primary care doctor sends you for a test because your blood tests are a little bit off. So people are walking around with this not even realizing it. So it's really important to catch this disease from a public health perspective early mm -hmm. so that we can prevent honestly the need for transplant, but for those patients that do require transplant, they now have a direct line within our inst two institutions to help uh, ha have us help you navigate that difficult process. That allows me to put in a plug right now. If, if you are in need of a physician, maybe you don't have a relationship with a primary care physician or you are in need of a specialist of some sort, um, go to our website, AtlanticHealth.org, and you will find the Find a Doctor um, button right at the top, and if you click on that, you can search by name, geography, specialty, whatever you want. It's all on there. So um, to Dr. Engel's point, those, a lot of these things get discovered with those long-term relationships, something that if Absolutely. you watch this program a lot, you know we've talked a lot about. Cultivating that relationship with your physician is very important. So if you don't have a doctor, please go on our website, AtlanticHealth.org, and, and use the Find a Doctor option. Um, uh, Dr. Gillum, the, the patients that are in need of heart transplant, I, I mean, Obviously, there is the heart failure component there. Um, but for anybody who's watching at home wondering, I have a, fa a history of, of, of heart disease in my family or, um, or any number of, of cardiovascular concerns, um, is the window of, of people who end up needing heart transplants very narrow? Or what, what kind of patients end up needing something like a heart transplant? So the vast majority of patients who need heart, heart transplants are people who have uh, pump failure. The heart you know, is pretty basic in terms of what, it's, what, it, what it has to do. It has to pump, and it has to move blood. And when that pump 
part of it starts to fail, people get fatigued, they get shorter breath. Those are the common symptoms. Sometimes people will get electrical problems uh, as, as well. So it's very, virtually never happens that anybody would wake up on day one and discover they need a transplant sure. without there having been typically a very protracted uh, uh, course. Uh, but as Sharon said, it's very important to have these conditions that uh, can lead to such advanced pump failure and the need for heart transplant potentially identified early because we have lots of treatments. The, um, so I think in terms of common causes, the um, heart attacks, coronary artery disease, bread and butter, bread and butter heart disease, but there are people who have primary muscle disorders. So we at Atlantic have a very large program for patients who have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, a very common disease that starts with the muscle genetically, uh, a genetically determined uh, disease. A very small subset of those patients need to be transplanted. Sometimes it's going to be the patient who has had uh, extended valve disease, uh, and then they, we have a group of patients who, for reasons that we don't entirely understand, it may be a viral infection, it may be something else, that the pump function of the heart just starts to fail. And okay. despite our best efforts, including medication, devices that we can put in to nudge things along, they will require transplant. I think, uh, if you don't mind, sure. one of the areas that you just mentioned is I think we have the technology here to diagnose, right, to find things mm -hmm. out early. Um, and I know at Gagnon they have phenomenal things in heart. Um, at Overlook for Liver, we have non-invasive ways to diagnose this, right? So, you know, I think that's, people hear things like this, they get nervous about biopsies and, and other things, which may be necessary, but um, the beauty of advancing technology is it really gives you ways to do things uh, easier and uh, less pain, more comfortably. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, we have ways to measure things like liver stiffness, similar to when they're looking at heart muscle. Um, that will give us something to follow for our patient so that we know when it's getting closer to time. We have a couple questions from the audience that I want to get to in just a moment, but before we do that, um, our partner in this, NYU Langone, mm -hmm. um, tell us talk about them a little bit. So for folks who are on the Jersey side who may have never had an interaction with them before, may not know anything about them, um, what is their reputation in this space and, and why, why did we choose to partner with them? So, I mean, short answer is we, you couldn't ask for better. They, um, on the heart side, they, uh, their program is relatively new. Mm -hmm. the, one of the things that's really important, actually tag teams a little bit with what the chairman's saying about hep C. So one of the things that they were pioneers in was uh, teaching us that we, in fact, can transplant hearts out of patients who have hep C. Uh, for up until very recently, those hearts could only be transplanted into recipients who also had hep C. We can treat hep C. Absolutely. I won't say we the cardiologists, they can treat they, 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 they can, they can treat hep C. They, I can't treat anybody, so no. <laughs> they can treat hep C. So um, uh, that's, a, that's a, a group of patients that the group at NYU really contributed our understanding that, that wow. uh, that's a group of hearts that we, we can uh, use with, with good outcomes. So their program has grown very quickly. Their, um, their outcomes are excellent. Uh, as a group of people, there's a lot of people connection in, in all of this, people connection between the providers, but people connection between the doctors and their patients. The, uh, we've connected very well with them as, as providers. They connect very well with our patients who have, who have been going there to be uh, uh, transplanted, and our patients have uh, reported back a wonderful patient experience. So as I said at the outset, you could not ask for a better partner, a superb transplant program. Absolutely, I mean, I think you point to how innovative they are, right? They, they align with what we look for in an institution. They align with who we are, right? Yeah. Um, so, and I think uh, to your point of the communication and the teamwork and, and the relationships, that cannot be understated. Uh, this is a two very complex diseases uh, with a lot of 
people that have to touch yeah. our patients in the way to be able to care for them well. You really need phenomenal communication between the team and really good teamwork. And I think they are very good at that. I think we are very good at that. Uh, so it kind of makes a nice marriage. Uh, one of the questions we got submitted ahead of time um, from folks in our audience, uh, and this was before I think we got into the details around um, heart and, and liver, which are defining this particular relationship. But this patient was wondering, you know, is there anything in the works with regard to kidney transplants? And, and as far as this partnership, um, not specifically, but how frequent is, is other organ transplantation done? Is that, I mean, for, for folks who would want to learn more about that, I suppose they could reach out to NYU. But, but as it stands to this, kidney transplant is not a part of this relationship. It is, it is just heart and liver, correct? That, that, that is correct. Got it. Yeah. For, for now. For, right. for now. Right. And yeah. I think sometimes patients may need more than one type of organ. So in those cases in a heart or a liver where, you know, a second type of organ like a kidney may be needed, um, you know, obviously you have the coordination on the NYU team to help with that and then, you know, integrating with our clinical teams. But there's nothing formalized at this point. So um, we have a, actually a question here. Uh, Jane wants to know, do you have recommendations for doctors who specialize in post heart transplant issues. So we happen to know <laughs> that that's exactly kind of what we're talking about. So is yeah. that, that for, Jane, uh, for Jane's interest, that is a type of service that Atlantic Health System provides. Yes, we, we provide that service. Uh, our, our heart failure program is called Heart Success because we want people to feel posi <laughs> po po positive. Uh, and, and yes, and, and, and the fact that we have those parts of this in place already is why this partnership is a logical uh, next, uh, next step. And I should sort of mention that, that part of this arrangement is going to be that the NYU doctors will come. There will be the first clinic in September, actually. Uh, and our own heart failure doctors will be going into NYU. So it might be that if you came as a heart transplant patient through Morristown, you would go in, have your transplant, and be rounded on there by the same doctor that you saw when you were seen at Morristown. So that personal continuity is really important. Excellent. Um, the, we, we haven't talked about COVID yet. Um, and, and this particular episode of this conversation is not strictly about COVID, but there may be folks wondering, you know, is it safe to have a, a, a transplant now in, in the era of COVID with everything that's going on? Um, can we talk a little bit about safety, how important safety is to us when we care for our patients and how confident patients can feel about safely receiving care? Dr. Angela, do you, do you sure. want to start? Sure. So, I mean, I can't underestimate the importance of vaccination, um, not just for our transplant population because they're very vulnerable. Um, but for all of the people that surround that transplant patient, right? Um, so that's quite key. And I think for now, you know, um, masking around that patient population is extremely important. You know, we do everything we can in the hospitals and in our clinics and in our offices to really keep our patients safe no matter what. But in this heightened era, I think <laughs> we do that to a significantly larger sure. degree, um, and that wouldn't change, right? You know, I think what we have in place right now is going to protect our patients. Um, but it's just kind of when they're out in the community, I think um, we have to just teach them how to protect themselves. So we have just uh, literally just a few moments left, um, and so I want to just, as we sort of come down the home stretch here, I mm -hmm. guess if you will, um, for um, patients who are nervous about about this uh, what what final words of encouragement we have for folks to um, to to take advantage of, of our program to to reach out for more information what what would you encourage people to consider if they're if they're worried you know we, we hear a lot of, from a lot of people who just don't especially when we do story um, segments about screenings a lot of people just don't want to be screened because they're afraid of the bad news they might get or sure. you know they out of sight out of mind kind of thing mm -hmm. let's just if we can encourage folks um, finally before we go about you know, how we can help them to, to seek out care if they need it. What, what would your message be to folks on something like this? Uh, my message would be, uh, again, short and simple. If you're worried about something, uh, get it checked out. It may not turn out to be something serious, or it may be turn out to be something that's potentially serious that can be definitively cured or absolutely prevented from becoming uh, uh, serious. And I guess the second, so it's not quite as simple as I promised, would be to uh, would be 
don't ignore symptoms. The, uh, don't sort of say to yourself, well, you know, I guess I'm just getting old in the case of heart disease. So I'm, maybe that shortness of breath is just I'm, I'm getting old. Maybe I put on a few extra pounds. Uh, get, it, get it checked yeah. out. Uh, the, we, have, we have ways that are, um, use advanced imaging, including those that give us three-dimensional images of your, of your heart. Uh, we have all kinds of ways of evaluating you and your and your heart that aren't painful, Correct. that uh, <laughs> that 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 are that are safe, uh, and that are um, uh, a, a, a very uh, I, I, I fall short of saying pleasant. Probably nobody would opt to have a test as opposed to going to the Jersey but Shore. Sure. But, but a, a completely benign patient uh, I experience to the point that people frequently say, oh my gosh, I was so worried and I feel so much better knowing, that's part number one, and this was, I expected it to be uncomfortable, whatever, last forever, and this was so much better than I Easier thought it was going to be. be. So yeah, don't, don't, don't worry, get it checked out. And Dr. Engel, this is a service. Our, our relationship with NYU is effective immediately. Yes, this is something is, we are we are moving full speed ahead on. Absolutely. In fact, uh, the office has opened, and we've seen a number of patients already. A, a couple, I'm hearing, that are already maybe <laughs> candidates. <laughs> candidates. So, but others that you know, we're going to work to keep them healthy. And, and you know, um, I think there's just. Uh, I'm going to put in a plug for primary care again. Um, mm -hmm. You know, as an internist, so it's um, probably more. Dear and I'm again biased, <laughs> but I do think developing that relationship with your primary care doctor, finding one you can have a relationship with, and I do think we have um, a ton of excellent ones, but it doesn't have to be so scary, right? I mean, develop that therapeutic relationship. Let us kind of help guide the process because it can be overwhelming. Um, and as far as NYU, yeah, I mean, I think we are very passionate, if you haven't, if you can't tell, <laughs> about these programs and, and what they can do for our community. Doctors, thank you so much for joining us. We are out of time. I told you it goes fast, mm -hmm. um, but I appreciate everybody for tuning in. Um, and, and certainly, if you need more information about anything we've talked about today, um, we have a, a ton of it on our website. Um, you can go to AtlanticHealth.org, and you can type in in the search field there. You can check the news uh, tab, because all of this stuff is also located on our news section on the website. Um, so please don't be shy. Reach out to us if you have any questions. Um, Dr. Angel, Dr. Gillum, uh, and their teams are, are here to help and, and certainly really excited about this new partnership. So thank you both for joining us today. It, as you said, it's been fun. And hopefully, <laughs> and hopefully you folks out there have found it enjoyable as well. Excellent, excellent. Thank you both, doctors. Thank you. All right, folks, thanks so much for joining us on Community Conversations. If you missed any part of it, uh, you can find the full thing on our YouTube channel or on our website, AtlanticHealth.org. I'm Luke Margolis. We'll see you next time.